Welcome to the Daily Fortune, where we talk about the latest topics about finance and investment. But before that, please don't forget to click the like button, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you'll know when we upload a new video. Now let's get started. Behold as we introduce the king of short selling, Michael Burry. There are some significant economic events that he was able to predict such as the dot-com bubble, 2008 recession and is now expecting the biggest market crash in US history. Burry gave a warning regarding to a wide array of things that may point directly to the aggressive sloping down of the economy. But what I'm going to show you is not merely in regards to the market crash but a more profound and in-depth discussion of China's situation and numerous indicators. This video is not made for the purpose of frightening anyone, but to give valuable information to get everyone equipped and be cautious of the pressing problems and risks ahead of us. Burry is a smart financial handler and always puts his money where his mouth is. And by doing so, he usually gets a large sum of money in return. Between 2000 to 2008, Burry had a mean return of 22% on an annual basis, which is, as a matter of fact, comparable to the world's most prominent investors. However, we can't bluntly say that Burry is always aware and keen on when the market would come crashing down. Identifying market crashes is absolutely hard and Burry, unfortunately, is not used to that kind of difficulty. One of Burry's investors said that a classic Burry trade would dramatically go up by 10 times in value but would first go down in half. This kind of pattern may be taking place again. For the 2002 recession, Michael was early on it and this time he may be early again. Burry gave a warning of a probable market crash down in December of 2020, so he may be a bit off to his moments and not that accurate. However, Michael Burry has always been correct on the latter part and there is a great chance of him being correct again this time. Burry recently shared an article consisting of 53 pages discussing the micro and macro elasticity of markets and the intuitive thoughts that lead to the given approximator. Confusions may rise to the terms of words that I just mentioned. Unless you're a market expert, the report may look and sound really complex, but it all just means very basic things. For instance, an investor may sell one dollar of bonds and buy another one stock. The question would be how this affects the overall valuation of the bond and stock market. A simple model may say that the bond market would decrease by one dollar and the stock market would go up by the same amount. However, this does not happen in real scenarios. With the utilization of diverse calculations, Researchers have found out that a dollar of investment in the stock market will actually lead to an increase by five dollars in the market. This occurs because when people purchase stocks, it complements the mutual funds to purchase stocks as well. For instance, let's assume that a person invested at least ten dollars in the stock market which results in a ten dollar increase. This makes the mutual fund invest ten in stocks as well because it would lead to a total of a twenty dollar increase since mutual fund invested ten in the stock. Prices would likewise grow to 10. There's more to it because that $20 increase would force a separate $10 investment of mutual funds bringing the total to up to $30. A mathematical model used in this research report said that every $10 invested in the stock market would result in the growth of the total market by 50. However, this ratio may not always be observed and is dynamic. Burry made tweets saying that if $5 of incremental market share results from $1 added to stocks and 90% of millennials aka future wealth owners are in passive market vehicles, that 5 to 1 ratio will get much sillier in time. Covid didn't stop it, inflation might not. He then discussed this further when he said that the first step to recognize that 5 to 1 is not a natural ratio. It is a product of a paradigm so what will continue this paradigm, what may reverse it, this is the knife's edge because we are at 5 to 1. It may go to 100, to 1, or become negative 5 to negative 1, but parabolas don't revolve sideways. Market valuations being high are easily affected with a small negative event which could trigger an immediate market crash. Market crash cannot be identified by just a random person, but just a single instance of crash could lead to a complete downfall. Michael thinks that we are in an identical situation as to the dot-com bubble because he saw that the dynamics of the price 15 years before the 21st century came in was extremely correlated. He added on his tweet that 94% correlation between the Nasdaq 100 and the 15 years to 2000. 
the SB500 shows 95. This is a direct implication of the relationship that we are at a particular variation like the dot-com bubble. A lot of people are aware that valuations are currently being elevated. The PDE of the S&P is dramatically soaring. Actually, the buffer indicator has been in its highest state compared to what it has reached before. This is the same situation with the margin debts or the loans utilized to purchase stocks. These scenarios are indicating that the market is in a severe fragile state wherein a single negative event could lead to heavily complex situations or in the worst case scenario, the biggest crash of all time. And such an event could lead to the ruin of the Evergrande. Now let's tackle facts about the Evergrande. It is a real estate company based in China owning 1,300 real estate projects in approximately 280 cities in China. This may sound really marvelous at first glance, but Evergrande also has the largest debts among all real estate developers in the world. The company has debts worth of $300 billion, and due to the failure of paying the interest that reached $35.9 million, it still has a repayment worth of $83.5 million remaining. However, Evergrande's management team has decided to pay investors with actual real estate properties to somehow settle their debts. So how related is this, and how does it matter in a way? Firstly, Evergrande isn't just a China-based company, but it is indebted worldwide to many banks such as Citibank, JP Morgan Chase, UBS, HSBC, and Bank of America by billions of dollars. By chance, these banks would lose their resources and would cease money lending to other companies. It may result in a freeze in the financial system. Cryptocurrency may also be one of the aspects that would be massively ruined by this event. One of the most prominent and renowned cryptocurrencies is Tether. Tether is a very famous stablecoin, meaning in every coin that you have, it is equivalent to one US dollar. The predicament is that it does not actually own real and physical coins or dollars, although they claim to have holdings reserved to guarantee that each tether is equal to a dollar. 65% of tether's reserve is in commercial papers or CP, which are short-term debt notes given by certain companies to investors. A concrete example would be if Apple wanted to issue $50 worth of commercial papers, they would sell that amount to a lender and that specific lender would receive a specific amount of interest usually with an annum. The unanswered query at this time is what amount of commercial paper does Tether actually have, most especially when it's not just pennies and dimes. They reportedly have $42 billion worth of crypto reserves, which are questionable, according to Burry. Burry retweeted a thread stating that Tether may be financing a company based in China. This may sound comical, but Evergrande may cause a devastating crash that will affect the entire market in all its sectors of the world. By now, everyone knows about the Tether reserves. Notably, they claim 50 of their reserves, commercial paper, many including myself, assumed the CP was just some sort of loan between Tether and the exchanges. But it's notable that Tether has empathically denied this. Tether's legal game is to say positive true things while not revealing the bad true things. So the D post a CNBC interview yesterday was incredible, categorically affirming that the CP is real double A rated. International CP are refusing several direct questions on whether it's Chinese, Burley stated in a tweet. Every commercial paper usually has ratings from A to C, triple A as the lowest risk and C being the highest risk. Tether is deemed to have a double A classification of commercial papers, which doesn't seem to be risky. However, Tether may be basing it from the debtor's affiliate and not the debtor himself. An article has defined how commercial papers are utilized by the Chinese as legal alibi to acquire budget sources for the fact that commercial papers do not have to be reported in financial statements. However, it doesn't appear that this is the practice anymore. Chinese regulators are now mandating to give reports regarding their monthly CP. The article from Reuters also explained that Evergrande Bank is under investigation for illegally obtaining loans up to $20 billion. Clues are lurking that Tether was the one that lent the $20 billion to Evergrande because no highly respected companies would borrow from Tether, and if there were any, they would not borrow money that large of an amount except if it became highly necessary or was an emergency. Another clue points to Tether that when the Chinese bank was investigated, a credible and trusted credit analyzer mentioned that it could be posing credit market risks. This was posted around the same time that the Boston Fed president stated that stablecoins are giving off great risks. They directly mentioned that Tether might be perpetrating the collapse of credit. 
Jim Cramer has termed Tether as a ticking time bomb and stated that Instead, in the last months, lots of important institutions and politicians have started looking into the risk from stablecoins, especially Tether, perhaps at our incessant prompting. I think that's fine, but it's also a step in the right direction. But not enough is being done to fix what many, including some of my Chinese sources, say is a ticking time bomb. Now we are aware that Tether may or may not be lending huge amounts of money to real estate developers in China, one of which is Evergrande. But how does it affect us in a direct manner? First and foremost, this is not a small scare scenario. It involves billions of dollars that are being invested to Tether and the downfall could mean the same for the financial system. The crash of Evergrande denotes the crash of the entire financial system. Simply put, the financial system is in great jeopardy and depends upon the collapse of Evergrande which is the triggering factor that may put the entire system in an apocalyptic crash. So that's pretty much it. The Michael Burry forecast on how the largest crash could occur in the US. Both Evergrande and Tether are suspicious institutions and may cause the crash eventually if not handled appropriately. However, this may still be corrected since there were a lot of crashes in the market before. So that's it for today. I hope you learned something from today's video. And to get updated with the next videos, don't forget to hit the notification bell. See you next time.